Father, we just want to thank you and praise you for your presence with us today. Lord, we thank you for every good gift you've given us. Lord, you prepared those good gifts long before the world was created. God, you prepared for us to be saved before you ever created anything. And God, we thank you for calling us to be your children. We thank you, God, for calling us together today to worship you here and to hear from your spirit. We pray, Lord, that you would just continue to speak to us as you already have through the words of those songs, through the words of your Bible, the words of your spirit. So, God, we ask that you not only continue to speak to us, God, but change us into Christ's likeness. We have more of your mind, more of your life in us, more of your kingdom perspective. And we'd be able, Lord, to mentor others in your ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everybody take your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 4 this morning. We'll be looking at verses 9 through 20. Let's all stand together for the reading of God's Word. I'm going to be reading from the 20th century King James Version. It's a little bit different from the New King James and the King James, but very similar. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. And the God of peace shall be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you always cared, you liked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect to want, for I have learned in whatever state I am there with to be content. I know how to be abased, I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Notwithstanding, you have done well that you participate in my affliction. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica you sent time and again to my needs, not that I desire a gift, but I desire the fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound, and I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, a sweet fragrance, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. There it is. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. I've been preaching a sermon series called But God. And this is my last sermon on that series. Not that I've exhausted all the scriptures to talk about but God, because really always in the Bible, even though it doesn't say those words, we see it happening again and again. Every day you see it happening in your life. The world seems like it's falling apart. But God. It seems like everybody in America is going to die. But God, you see, the Lord is able to do anything, any time. We don't always get what we want. Sometimes God knows best to say no. But the Lord always gives us what he wants to give us. And what he knows is best for our lives if we're seeking him. I ask you today, how are you doing with contentment in your life? You see, the Word of God says that we should always try to be content. The title of the message is, You Will Suffer Need, But God. That but God means that He can help you be content even when you do suffer need. But you've got to grow to that, don't you? When I was young, July 20th, 1969, I was baptized. Does that sound familiar to you, that date when the astronauts landed on the moon and walked on the moon? I heard my mom say to me, you'll never forget this day, Philip, as long as you're living, even in heaven. Because the day you're baptized and the day the astronauts land on the moon, the same day. 
And sure enough, <laughs> I can't forget it. And after that time, as uh, I grew as a young Christian, I began doing something kind of weird. I began counting the days till something happened that I was excited about. Just like I counted the days till I was baptized. It kind of became a tradition with me, and kind of a habit. A fun thing for me, because I looked forward to it. It would happen, and I'd celebrate. But I, I would count the days before we would go to my family's lake house at Lake Whitney. That was one of my favorite places to go, to get out of that busy, crowded city and to get out to Central Texas, praise God, where I love to be and walk on those dirt roads. So, see, Frankie, that's why I wasn't too disturbed when we moved over on Goliath when the streets weren't done, because I'm <laughs> used to those dirt roads. See, God prepared me. But when I was uh, a student in class, I would count down those days. Monday morning at 9 a.m., four days and nine hours to blast off to the lake house. And every day I would, I would count it down. I had a little bit of free time in class, and I'd say, how, how long now? How long now? And I'd count it down. And then the day arrived on Friday. Couldn't wait to get out of school. Couldn't wait to get to the lake house, because every minute was fun down there. And then it started raining. And my mom walks in when it's about time to go, and she goes, I'm so sorry, guys, but it's pouring down rain out there. We're not going to the lake house because I don't want to risk getting in a wreck. Those big rigs that follow us, they might not stop. And they may kill us. And I, Mom, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Listen to those cars driving down Mockingbird Lane out there in front of our house, one after another. There's no way they're not having a rent. She goes, you know what? I'm sorry to disappoint you and make you sad. But you know, it's a whole lot better for you to be sad about this than losing somebody, maybe all of us in your family. And so, boy, I just got so upset. First, I got angry and started beating my bed and never thought about praying to the Lord for help, you know. Should have. And then I got depressed, so depressed. And I had some maturing to do, didn't I, in the area of contentment. I had some maturing to do in the area of understanding the providence of God. And then when things started happening, when, when things would not go the way I thought they should go, things I looked forward to that just fell apart, I learned to say, okay, Lord, you know what's best. It even happens today. We look forward to something. We, uh, we, we, we look day after day and month after month, we look forward to something happening and bam, it just doesn't happen. It just doesn't occur. And we, we remind each other, listen, God knows what's best. Yeah. You know, maybe this happened because we could have gotten in a car wreck. Or maybe it's happened because uh, something else could have happened even worse. But, you know, we remind each other of that. Not long after that experience in 1969, on July 4th, the Rolling Stones song was released that says these words, you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometime, you might find you get what you need. How about that? Mick Jagger finally sang one from the Bible, right? <laughs> he didn't do that much. John Bunyan said this, If we have not quiet in our minds, outward comfort will do no more for us than a golden slipper or a gouty foot. This is an old Jewish proverb. It's very true. When life isn't the way you like it, like the way it is. Life doesn't always turn out the way we would like. All of us, oh, I dreaded that when I was a kid, losing my mom and dad, losing my grandparents. Oh, I dreaded that day. But you know, when they get sick, when life no longer has quality, and they're no longer the same, you get ready to let them go and not have to suffer anymore. And we get ready to go, don't we? But I encourage you, don't ever lose hope. Keep praying, believing till that final moment that you pass. If you believe God wants you to live longer. Because God can do 
all things. But God can do all things. When Helen Keller was very old, she was beginning to lose even her hearing. She had been able to speak since a child and was blind since birth, but this is what she wrote in her old age. They took away what should have been my eyes, but I remembered Milton's paradise. They took away what should have been my ears. Beethoven came and wiped away my tears. They took away what should have been my tongue, but I had talked with God when I was young. He would not let them take away my soul, possessing that I still possess the whole. John Henry Jowett told about a small village where a very old widow died. She had no family, no eyesight, no hearing, no money. But during her life, her selfless service made a huge impact for Jesus and the kingdom of God. On her tombstone were written these words, she did what she could not. How about that? Does that describe your life? She did what she could not. He did what he could not. But who did it? Jesus, through her, did that, see? Today you'll hear prosperity preachers say that if you ever get in need, it's because you don't have enough faith or you have some kind of unrepentant sin in your life you need to get rid of. That's not always the case, folks. Sometimes it is, and if it is, it needs to be dealt with. But sometimes people who have great faith and who are repenting of their sin that they do every time they slip and fall have difficult times and go through need. Examples in the Bible, Job, a godly man who suffered in order that the Lord could show everybody in the world of every generation that you can make it through difficulty. And you don't have to curse God because things don't happen the way you want them to happen. The Apostle Paul is another one who had some kind of thorn in his flesh, difficult eyesight, and probably pain in his eyes his whole life, but he said, you know what? <laughs> I rejoice for that thorn in my flesh because in it, God is made strong. And then Jesus, of course, fasted. He chose to be in need to show us that we too should fast and be in need in order to show us that God's Spirit can help you through anything in life and you can remain content, as God says in the Apostle Paul. You know, Philippians 4.13 is one of those verses that we memorize. I had it on a poster in my bedroom when I was a teenager. And it had a football player running with the football. And it reminded me that, that no matter how tough football gets or practice or games get, God can help me to keep going. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But you know, it never occurred to me to read the whole context of those verses to understand exactly what the Apostle Paul meant. Folks, he was talking about being in need. I can do all things, meaning I, this is the, the, the perfect content of it, I can be in any kind of need that there is in this world. I can be in any kind of pain or hunger or thirst or persecution. I can go through that. How? Through Christ who strengthens me, see? Only through Jesus. And he gets all the glory. Some Christians just quit. I can't. Preacher, I just can't keep going. No, you can't. But Jesus in you can. And Paul learned to say, I am an overcomer through Christ whenever I am in need. You remember that, church. You remember that. Write this down for number one. When you find yourself in need, pray, believe, have peace. Then expect Jesus to provide what you need in His perfect timing and rejoice. Look at verse 9. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. And the God of peace will be with you. You know, that just didn't happen. Don't, don't you wish you had... 
the gift of contentment. Have you ever seen that in the Bible, that that's a gift? No. It's learned behavior. It's not a spiritual gift. You receive spiritual gifts when you're saved. At least one spiritual gift. Contentment ain't one of them. You grow in that. You learn from that. And then as you continue to grow and mature as a Christian, you're able to say what Paul says. Whatever you hear me say, whatever you see me do, do that. You'll be living for the Lord. And God will be with you. You know what? Some Christians are so mature they say, well, that's braggadocious. That's awful proud to say something like that. The Apostle Paul said it. Jesus said, I believe Joseph, who was another one of those who endured during difficult times with God's contentment. They were able to say that. Why? Because they matured in the Lord and they gave Jesus all the glory. See? So when you tell people, you know what? Follow me because I follow Jesus. You're giving Jesus the glory. Every Christian needs a mature spiritual mentor. Also to be your prayer partner. Also to be the one who is your accountability partner. Who you share all things with and you can trust them. That God will speak through them. That they're not going to be 100% perfect, are they? Ask me this morning, what best describes you most of the time? A, are you extremely content most of the time, like the Apostle Paul grew to be? B, well, I'm mostly content. C, I could say I'm somewhat content. D, I'm mostly discontent. Or F, I am extremely discontented. Which one would describe you? You know what, if you don't have a lot of joy and peace in your life, this is the root problem. Because you are not being thankful for the things that God has given you day by day. Like the rest of America, you're always wanting more. Keeping up with the Joneses. You know what, why do Americans look at their neighbors that have more than them instead of looking at their neighbors who have so much less than them? Remember the guy who goes around talking about Jesus and how to be an overcomer, and he has no arms and he has no legs. Be thankful. Be content with what you have. Because there's always somebody else that has less. God is the giver of all good gifts. It takes Christian maturity. You pray this prayer. Lord, is this a real need or is this an imagined need? Can I wait for this? Can I do without this? How can I use this for your glory and not just for my selfish satisfaction? Look at verse 10. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you care for me and flourished again Though you always cared, you lacked opportunity. Last week I talked about when you feel forsaken. What's the answer to that? How do you overcome feeling forsaken? You reach out. You allow the Lord Jesus to reach out to those around you and they will show, those who really love you, will show they care for you. Instead of having a pity party about being lonely or about having any need, the greatest solution for that is what? Reaching out in ministry and sharing with others what God has already shared with you. The devil loves it, church. Listen to this. The, de the devil loves it more than anything else to take away your joy, your peace, and contentment. Because then he makes you ineffective. See? Worrying about the what ifs. Boy, some, some people you read on Facebook, that's all they do. Just, just post after post after post. And, well, I'm worried about this. Look at this. Oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? God, listen to the messages. But God, He's got the solution. He's got the answer. And He promised in His Word, it's going to be okay. They're not spending enough time with the Lord 
or they wouldn't go around with the what ifs and worrying all the time and, and causing others to lose their peace and joy in the Lord. And you always want to encourage people like that and pray for them. The Lord Jesus Christ wants us to be optimistic, doesn't he? Full of faith. Because why? We, you sang about it. He is a good, good father. Yeah, yeah. And he can and always will be trusted. Verses 14 through 18 is where Paul is, is talking to the church at Philippi. He's telling them, you know, I've been waiting for this to come. And, not, you know, he, he's been in need for a while. But he hasn't griped about it. He hasn't complained and had a pity party about it. He just said, okay, you know, God's going to give me what I need. And, and if he doesn't, if I starve to death, I go to heaven anyway. But he knew he wasn't going to starve to death, didn't he? Even if he had to fast a day out of the week, or maybe a week out of the month, or maybe eat bread and water every day until he had more finances, he knew they would come. And this church of Philippi was a poor church. And finally they sent this gift that even the wealthy churches didn't send. And he's thanking them for that. And he's saying, I'm not writing you to tell you that you need to give more. I'm writing to tell you how God blessed me through your gift. And not just me, but his ministry. I ask you this. What if people in the church said, you know what, the, the pastor is saying that the church is meeting their needs. People in church are giving and they're meeting their budget. Well, I don't have to give. I don't have to. I put it in savings. I don't have to give a thing because they're meeting their budget. What if every Christian said that? We would never be able to do ministry. We'd never be able to have church because the electric bill wouldn't be paid. We would never be able to have full-time ministers or even part-time ministers. We wouldn't be able to send missionaries anywhere. So church, we need to say, what is God's will? Remember the widow giving her last coin. See, if you, if you just drop a penny in this offering plate, and that's what God wants you to drop, that's your last penny, you know what? God's going to bless yes. that penny. And God's going to give you what you need. Right. Some people think, well, if I can't give $5, I'm not going to give anything. I'm not going to be embarrassed. You bring $1 up here, praise God. You bring a penny up here, praise the Lord. Nobody's going to laugh at you like the Pharisees. Yeah. God will bless you. Yes. But I encourage you, if you don't give, you're going to miss the blessing. You're going to miss the abundant blessings God wants to give you in your life. And it's not only giving up your time and talents. It's giving of your tithe, the three T's, the time, the talents, and the tithes, see? God, those belong to God. And if we don't give them to God, we're robbing God, and we're robbing ourselves and our family and our church from many blessings. Write this down, Malachi 3, 8 through 10. Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you, Lord? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you. Do you know that in every church only a small percentage of the Sunday morning attenders give anything? A small percentage of attenders continue to meet the needs of the church. Now, I don't check records. I don't know what you give. I don't want to know what you give. I don't want to treat anybody any different. That's why. That was always my policy. And I learned it from other pastors. It mentors me. But God knows. And you're robbing yourself. And you're robbing your church. And the nation, America, is robbing God. You are under a curse, America. The whole nation of you. You pay your money at the restaurant. You pay your money at Walmart. You pay your money to go see a movie. But you can't pay God what belongs to Him. I wonder why we're having two hurricanes hit the south gulf of Texas at once. Never happened before. 
I wonder why we have all those fires in California they can't put out that have burned over 400 homes down and they can't stop the fire. I wonder why we have a pandemic that spread all over America and it won't leave us. One thing after another. Earthquakes in crazy places that have never happened before. Folks, we're in the last days, but you know why? Because we're under a curse. The whole nation of you. Because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. That there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord God Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Do you know that in the midst of everything I just talked about that's going on in America, with all the fires and smoke that's in California, they're having revival in California. And unbelievers are running to the beach water to be baptized after they receive Jesus. That is what God does. Every 100 years in America we have a pandemic and then a great awakening. And I hope you're praying and working for that third great awakening. Look at verses 11 through 13. Now that I speak in respect to one, for I have learned, excuse me, not that I speak in respect to one, but I have learned in whatever state I am, therewith to be content. I know how to be abased, I know how to abound. Everywhere, in all things, I'm instructed both to be full and be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I want you to write down these things. These are ways you can grow in spiritual contentment. Number one, what we talked about earlier, is have a mentor. Somebody that holds you accountable. Someone that you look up to who follows the Lord and is more mature than you. Number two, remember the examples of people who have spiritual maturity and contentment in the Bible. Job, Joseph, Daniel, the Apostle John. Those are my favorites, but there's more. Also, remember when you experience need, God is teaching you something. Pray for God's direction. Listen carefully to what God is trying to tell you. Which way to go. How to bring good from what has happened. Also, listen to this, write this down. Ask God for his power to fast from what you think you need, but you don't really need it. I'll say it again. Ask God to give you power to fast from what you think you need, but you don't really need it. Our flesh gets hungry, doesn't it? Oh, I gotta have this. I just I just thought about it, you know. I don't know why, but I just got to have this. Sometimes Don and I will talk to each other. Where, where are we going to eat? Oh, man, I'm craving coconut shrimp. <laughs> oh, I'm craving a steak. But you know what? The answer is you really don't need that. Something else might be what God wants you to have right now. Our flesh craves for things. And we replace that craving in the flesh and crave for the things of God. See, that would be more beneficial for us. That's God's answer. Whatever we eat, the Bible says, whatever we drink, whatever we say or whatever we do, we're to glorify the Lord and live as an example for others to follow. Number four, rest in God's ability to provide what you really need. God is faithful. Don't just sing Good, Good Father on Sunday only, church. Sing it every day. Sing Great is Thy Faithfulness every day. Because He's always faithful. Rest in the faithfulness of God. Don and I remind each other all the time, God's been faithful before. He's always been faithful and He always will be faithful. When you're waiting for God to open the door, be faithful in the hallway. Some people are always wanting more. The grass is always greener on the other side. Be faithful where God has you. And God will bless you. 
Matthew 6 says, the lost worry all day long. That's all they think about. What are we going to eat? Where are we going to go eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? Who are we going to marry? What, my, what is my job going to be? Can I get a better job, a higher paying job? Can I have better health? Can I look like those good looking people on TV? Sometimes you have to give up on that one, right? <laughs> be thankful for what God has given you. Number five, be thankful for those God has given you, the people God has given you, not just the things, but the people. Be thankful for the salvation God has given you. All the blessings of all your life, be thankful. Number six, don't compare yourself with others who have more than you. We talked about that. Number seven, learn to focus on the needs of others rather than the things that you selfishly want. See, when you start focusing on others and their needs, just like last week about being lonely, no, you no longer focus on your own need and have your little pity party, do you? We need to get over those pity parties, parties, don't we? Number two, when you find yourself in need, remain content. Watch and pray for opportunities of ministry and spiritual growth. So, <clears throat> first of all, when you have a need, you pray. And, and some of you haven't heard me say this before, so I'll say it again. It reminds you as your pastor that when you pray for something, pray for it one time. Don't keep begging God. The guy didn't go to the door, keep knocking on the door for the guy to answer the door because the guy forgot. Yeah. It was because he knew his neighbor loved him and would be faithful to open it. Yeah. So you don't beg God for things. You pray one time knowing his faithfulness, and then you thank him that he's going to give that to you in his perfect timing after you pray for it one time. And then the next step is what we're looking at now. You remain content that God's going to give you what you need. And then you watch and pray. You get out of your own selfish little box and you watch and pray for opportunities of ministry and spiritual growth for yourselves and for others. See, That will help you grow in that contentment. Look at verses 19 and 20 in closing. But my God, there it is, but God, but my God shall supply all your wants and selfish desires. Is that what your Bible says? All your wants and selfish desires? Everybody's head goes like this. No, preacher. God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now unto God our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. God owns all the cattle on all those hills, doesn't he? God owns everything in this world. God is still on the throne. Amen? God is still on the throne and he has never left his throne. He knows everything going on in our nation, in our world. God knew it was going to happen in 2018. 2019. And on, tw on 02, 20, 20. That won't happen again for another 100 years. But on that day, we didn't know what would happen in March, did we? <clears throat> Crazy, isn't it? Remember what I said when we turned into 2020? God wants us to have perfect spiritual vision. And boy, it's needed now, isn't it? We never knew what that would mean. But now we do. Don't be like a rebellious teenager. Did you ever hear about the teenager who was so stubborn that mom and dad took away her cell phone for a week and that didn't help her change her ways? Then they had to take away her television privileges for a week. They turned off all the TVs, just unplugged them. Oh, she thought she'd go crazy but it didn't help the rebellion one bit. See, they said they weren't going to spank her anymore after she was 12 years old. But they'd take things away. So they took away her bed and she had to sleep on the floor in her room. They actually put it in storage. She still had a hard heart. So they took 
away every piece of furniture and every bit of clothing except for two or three articles of clothing. And finally she repented. Finally she quit rebelling against her parents and against God. What will it take for America to repent? The rebellious teenager that keeps getting things taken away. I was watering the plants out in front of our church yesterday. And people were playing games right across the street yelling, using God's name in vain. What will it take? That's exactly what through my mind. What is it going to take for America to take God seriously? You think this roller coaster's tough? I, I thought the mini mine train was tough until I rode the mine train. I thought the mind train was tough until I rode the shockwave. I thought the shockwave was tough until I rode the tight. Then when it goes down, you feel like you're on the back of the jet plane. And the G-force, you feel the G-force an hour after you get off that thing. I hope we don't have to get on the tight in America. Before America repents. And the majority of people come to God. And say, God, we're sorry. We turn from you. We need your help, God. Only one time have I heard the news media pray to God for help. Only one time since this has happened. And it's never happened again. Number three, write this down. When you find yourself in need, glorify Jesus for supplying your needs and testify about His love and faithfulness. He will supply your needs. But how many Christians were out saying, God gave me what I needed. Praise Him. The Bible commands us to proclaim the glories of the Lord. From Genesis all the way through Revelation, we are to tell people how good our wonderful, faithful Heavenly Father is. Glorify Jesus for supplying your needs and testify about his love and faithfulness. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you and praise you for how you spoke into our hearts this morning. We pray for America, God. God, you would continue to do whatever it takes to bring people to their knees. And God, help us not to shake with fear when we see it happening all around us. Help us to be like those faithful ones in the Bible. Especially those in Egypt that saw everyone falling and dying all around them, but you kept your children safe. And God, some of us, some of us will pass, but it's still a win-win because we know where we're going. We know our sins have been forgiven. But God, I pray for those right now who don't have that faith. I pray for those who think they're saved by works and they're, they're never sure if they're going to heaven because they're not sure if they've been good enough. Jesus, we thank you that you told us you have been good enough. Only you are good, God. Any good in us is because of you, Jesus. God, we thank you for being good enough. We thank you for paying the penalty in full for us at the cross. Lord, your word says in 1 John 5, 13, these things are written so you can know that you have everlasting life. And I pray, Lord, that those who don't know that, those who don't have that assurance, that peace, that contentment, God, that they come to you right now. And say, Jesus, save my soul. Jesus, take control. Lord, I pray that you save their souls right now. If you said that prayer, praise Him for saving your soul, forgiving you forever by His death on the cross alone, not by words. And Lord, I pray that for those of us who do know You, even those new Christians just prayed that prayer, God, empower us now to do Your words. And only by Your power are we able to obey You. And allow your spirit to live through us to do good works and do ministry.
So God, every day mature us. Every day help us to grow where we can mentor others in your ways. Lord, there are so many people who call themselves Christians. And if they're Christians, they're diaper babies. God, grow them up. Help them see that they're going to have to give an account for their lives when they meet you face to face. Lord, I pray for every Christian. Listen to my voice right now. God, that you would help us all to put you first every day and take time to pray to you as first love. Take time to listen to you and gain your instruction as our commanding officer, our master. We know your way is best, Jesus. Help us to live the words we've heard today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand together for the invitation. I want to encourage you, right where you are, just to listen to the song that's being played in loud 